Well, amen. amen. Glory to God. Psalm chapter 3 says, Many are they that rise up against me, but thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. Hallelujah. Boy, somebody ought to get excited this morning. Hallelujah. I didn't bring this out to hurt anybody. I am going to use that here in just a little while. Amen. I think the only thing I like better than directing that choir is listening to them. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15. We've been talking over the last few weeks about lessons from the king. Lessons learned from the king. We looked at it several weeks ago about seeking God for his wisdom. And we talked about the life of Solomon, the difference between being clever and smart and being wise. And then we looked at seeking God for his way. The Bible says the ways of a man seem right to him, but the end result is not good. So we seek God for his way. Last week we talked about seeking God in war. There are times we are called to fight battles and we seek God to win the war because he's the only one that can win the battles that we need to win. Today we're going to talk about seeking God in worship. Seeking God in worship. Worship changes you. If it doesn't, you probably did not worship. An encounter into the presence of a holy God changes us. That's how we know we've been with God, is there's a change. The Bible says that when Moses came into the presence of God at the burning bush, the Lord said, take off your shoes from off your feet because where you're standing is holy ground. Moses had to do something different. Real worship changes who we are. It is impossible for you to come into an encounter with a holy God and remain the same. Worship changes you. Let's look at chapter 15 and verse 1. So the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, and one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for the work Will, for, for your work will be rewarded. Amen. Amen. I pray that God bless the reading of his word. And I pray God speak to our heart this morning through his word. Worship changes us. Now, a couple of things that I want you to notice. We've been talking, uh, we're going to look at today. Uh, the story of Azariah in chapter 15. We're going to look at all of chapter 15. This morning, we're going to talk about Azariah's prophecy. This evening, we're going to talk about Asa's preparations and the assembly's promise. We're going to see after, after the prophecy, we're going to see a, a response from, the, from Asa and from the people. Asa, had, he did some preparations based on the prophecy of Azariah and the people assembled together and they made a promise based on the prophecy and based on the preparations of Asa. So that's what we're going to look at all day today. So uh, that should be an encouragement to you that uh, one meal this morning is not going to be enough. Boy, that was tough right there. It's tough. I don't know about you, but I very rarely eat just one meal a day. Uh, I usually come back to the Lord and I just buy a meal. Maybe I talk about the meal. Uh, 
and I'm on, I'm not there. Hey, how about there? Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. See, the devil don't want me to say to you what needs to be said, but I ain't going to stop. So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about all day today. So I encourage you to come back tonight because, uh, and get the rest of the story. I'm only going to give you a, a third of it this morning, so you're going to need to come back tonight and get the rest of it. All right, let me show you a couple of things about Azariah. The verse 1 in Azariah's prophecy, he says, The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa. Now, the Bible shows us, as we study it, that this is the first time we've ever heard of Azariah. It's the first time he's ever come on the scene. And the Bible, if we study the Bible, we find out that we don't see him again. This is the only time Azariah the prophet appears in Scripture. Now, if it were me, if God were taking note of my life and he was going to mention me in his word just once, I'm glad if I were Azariah, I would be glad that when I got mentioned, it's because I obeyed God. Amen? I mean, he's in the Bible because the Spirit of God came upon him and he went. Because you see, there are other people in the Bible that's not mentioned very often, if only once, and they did not do what God said. They did not leave the Scripture with a good reputation. So I praise the Lord. Azariah is the kind of person I want to be. If I'm only going to be talked about one time, if on the course of my history upon this earth, my name gets brought up in conversation only once, I hope what's going to be said is the Spirit of God had come upon him and he obeyed. He obeyed. I would not want to be the person that when you'd mention my name is, you know what, he had great potential, but, but. Because you know, anytime you say something and then you use the word but, you have just negated everything you just said. That's like saying, bless your heart. <laughs> well, she's just not that pretty, bless her heart. <laughs> you laugh, that's how you use it. You just don't come up somebody on the street and go, I just wanted to bless, bless your heart. No, no, usually we say that when we've just said something ugly. And we follow it with bless your heart or bless her heart, or bless his heart. I would hate the thought that if my name comes up in the course of a conversation, it was, he could have been, but. But Azariah, bless his heart. He's mentioned one time in scripture, and praise the Lord, it's because the spirit of God came on him, and he did what God said. The Bible says, the spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and all Judah and Benjamin. And what we're going to talk about first of all in Azariah's prophecy is he's going to give him a review of the present. A review of the present. He's going to sum up the current situation. This is what's going on right now. You remember last week we talked about Asa facing the Cushite army and with overwhelming odds. And that they were outnumbered at least two to one, possibly even more. And Asa called on the Lord his God and said, Lord, we rely on you. Who can fight a, a, an enemy like that? We rely on you. It's way beyond our control. And the Bible says that the Lord attacked the Cushites. And they, they brought about a great victory. God wrought a great victory. And they brought home plunder from the war. So you can just imagine with me this morning in the theater of your imagination, you can imagine with me the men coming home. Asa is leading his troops home. They are excited. They've just, just seen God work a miracle in, the, in a decisive battle. And they're coming home happy. They're singing uh, the victory songs. And you can hear the sound of sheep and cattle behind them. The spoils of war. They're having a great time. Asa comes out to share a prophecy from God. Because you see too often when we have won a great victory, something you really need to remember if you've not learned this already, or you may have learned it, but we tend to forget it, is that sometimes the greatest defeat follows your greatest victory. Sometimes the greatest defeat follows your greatest victory. 
And the reason is because we just won a great battle. Maybe you've been praying for something long and hard and, and you've been fasting and praying, you've been digging in and you're saying, Lord, I'm not letting you go until you answer me. And you see God win a victory and answer to prayer and you go, man, I'm glad that's over. And we relax and we quit focusing. Oswald Chambers said, you no more need a holiday from spiritual concentration than your heart needs a holiday from beating. Think about that for a moment. Maybe your heart, you know, when we run or exercise, or for those who do, I'm told, <laughs> that after a while, if you push it too hard, your muscles just give out. They're tired. Aren't you glad the heart doesn't do that? You know what? I've been beaten for 23 and a half hours today, and I'm just tired. I'm going to take a break. No, no, no. You see, the Bible says, your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion, roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And that brief moment of time you decide that you're tired of being spiritually concentrated is when he attacks. Because, see, he doesn't take a break. He doesn't have a holiday. He doesn't go on vacation. See, it's one thing to vacate from your job. It's another, another, thing, another thing to vacate from your God. We don't have the luxury of vacationing our mind and our spirit from concentrating on God. That's when you'll make a mistake. And I believe the warning from Azariah, as the army is coming home from a great victory, is to them, hey, don't let up. Let me explain to you where we are. Here's what the Spirit of God has said. Here's what the Word of God is for you. So here's what he said. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. It was a wake-up call. He was reviewing the current situation, reviewing the present. Here's where you are. You just want a great victory, but don't lose sight of where God is. Because as long as you're with him, he's with you. As long as you seek him, he'll be found by you. But the moment you stop seeking the Lord and you forsake him is the moment he forsakes you. We can never let down our guard from seeking after God. Now, here's the thing you need to remember. God has a plan. Now, for some strange reason, he didn't consult you about his plan. He didn't send me an email this week and say, hey, here's what I'm thinking about doing. What do you feel about that? How do you think about that? Has he ever done that for you? No, he, if you say yes, you, you're lying this morning. God has a plan and he doesn't need your opinion. He has never once consulted uh, my opinion about what he's doing. And even when I'm going through something that I don't particularly care for and I'm saying, God, I really don't understand why you're doing this right now. And just to be quite honest, I don't like it. And don't you know God goes, oh, no. He didn't like it. No, no, no. You see, God always does what's best for me, whether I like it or not. He has a plan. He has a blueprint. And he's following that blueprint. Blueprint. He's, he's, he's heading the line. And all he says is, seek me. Seek me. And you'll, you'll find it. God's plan is not so mysterious that he didn't want you to find it. The will of God is not so hidden that he doesn't want you to have it. There is one requirement. You seek him. You seek him and he'll be found. If you forsake him, then you don't know where you're going. You don't have a clue. The, the review of the present is be careful. It's a warning. Be careful. You've just won some victories. You've seen God do some great things. Don't relax. Don't let down your guard. Don't quit praying. Because as long as you're with him, he's with you. Now, the Bible says that the Lord is our shepherd. That's what Psalm 23 teaches us. The Lord is my shepherd. That's what this is for. My dad gave this to me not long after I went into the ministry. It's a shepherd's rod. The Lord is my shepherd, and he's leading. He's leading. Now, it's my job to follow. 
That's what God created me to do, is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what the, literally the, the Christian title, it's not, just a, it's not meant to be a religion. It's meant to describe my lifestyle. I'm following wholeheartedly after the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm trying to imitate him. I'm, I'm following, when he takes a step, I take it. And when he turns, I turn and I take that step and follow him. The only way I can know where God's going is that he's leading me, his shepherd, his staff. He's my shepherd. I'm following after him. But you see what happens is, in our life, and I'll just speak for me for a moment because it's true of me. I'm gonna assume it's true for you because we're all human, is that sometimes God leads me in a direction. I'm going, well, I don't really like that. He begins speaking to my heart and dealing with who I am. And he says, I'm going in this direction. Oh, Lord, I don't know if I really want to go that way. And so he takes this step and I take this one. And he's over here. Now, I love that the illustration that Brother Lance gave us last week from Shelby's uh, uh, Facebook. It, if you're not as close to God as you used to be, guess who moved? Well, it wasn't him. Because he has a plan. Psalm 33 tells us in verse 10 that the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of peoples. But his plan endures forever. The purposes of his heart are everlasting. His plans are forever. Now, sometimes we have our own plans. And we go this direction. God went that direction. Now, God didn't, God didn't move away from me. I quit following his step. Because you see, he went somewhere I didn't want to go. So he moved that way, I moved this way. And then at that point, the Holy Spirit of God is saying, hey, hey, you missed it. God went that way. You see, it's my job to find out where God is. Now God is gracious when I start moving away from him. He draws me, he's, he's saying to me, hey, come back this way, I'm over here but it's my job to seek him to find out because the Lord is with me when I'm with him. God's here. This is his plan. This was his purpose. This is where he's going. And when I'm going the other way, I'm not with God. See, what we want to do is we want to come over here and say, Lord, this is where I would like to be. Would you come join me? But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you're with him, he, or he's with you when you're with him. And it's my job to seek him, to find out where he's going, where he's leading, and look for him. When my boys were younger, we'd go into Walmart, and we'd be walking up and down the aisles. And, and of course, when they were, were a, lot, a lot younger, I would always, they had to stay with me. They couldn't just wander off and go wherever they wanted to go. They had to stay with me. Uh, because I want to keep an eye on them. Of course, they'd beg, Daddy, Daddy, can we go to the toy department or can we go to you know, Josh? It was always electronics. He and I are alike in that way. We want to go look at the, all the new stuff. And at some point, I would say, All right, boys, come on, let's go. And I'd start heading to wherever I was going next. And they didn't, sometimes they wouldn't follow because they had their eyes on their, what they wanted, what they were looking after, what their heart was looking for. And they didn't come. And I, I might would turn around and say, Hey, guys. I'm, coming, I'm going. But sometimes what would happen is I would move on. I'd go to another aisle. Now I knew where they were, but I'd do it on purpose. I'd go ahead and go to another aisle. I wouldn't go far, but I'd go somewhere else. And next thing I hear is, Daddy! <laughs> That's something you want to hear in Walmart, isn't it? <laughs> Daddy! I was like, I'm over here. And Josh one day come run over going, where'd you go? It's like, I went right here. You left us. No, no, no. It's your job to keep up with me. It's not necessarily my job to keep backtracking to make you do what I said. I told you to come on. I told you I was leaving. I told you I was going somewhere else. You decided to stay back. It's your job to keep up with me. That's the way it is with God. He's our shepherd. He's leading. It's our job to stay with him. Because you're with him, or he's with you, rather, when you're with him. When you seek him, you'll be found. He'll be found. But if you forsake him, 
he'll forsake you. And you know what, literally what that's describing is, is the fact that when I was on another aisle, my boys felt forsaken. I knew where they were the whole time. I wasn't ignoring their cry or their call. I knew where they were. I'm the one that moved. I took a direction and they didn't follow. So there are times in our lives where we feel God has forsaken us. No, we didn't follow him. He took a step this way. We decided to go this way. Or we didn't go at all. As as Arise prophecy was to review the current situation. You have a choice now. You can be with God and know that God is with you as long as you're with him. And you can seek him and there's a promise that he'll be found or you can forsake him and not obey him. And it will look like he forsook you. The truth of it is God is right where you left him. And when we get over here in our own way, in our own direction, doing what we want to do, God is calling. He's convicting. The Holy Spirit is drawing. And you know what's not going to happen is, Lord, I'm sorry that I went all the way over here. I'm sorry I went all the way over here. But God, could you just come and, and meet me right here? Oh, no, no. No. Repentance means I turn around and I start walking back to where he's at. Seeking him means I come back to where I left him. It doesn't mean that God meets, no, he don't meet me halfway. His will, his purposes, his plans stand firm. And God waits right here, right where you left him. And he's calling, he's drawing. Come home. Repent, turn around, come back. The review of the present is, seek him and he will be found. Stay with him, follow him, and he's right there with you. That's the review of the present. I want you to look at now a reminder of the past. A reminder of the past. A part of his prophecy in verse 3 is, For a long time Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, and one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. You see, Israel had a cycle that I'm sure you're very well aware of, They would seek God, they'd repent, they'd come back to the Lord and God would give them success, he would give them rest. And in their success and their prosperity, they would turn away from God and and move into disobedience and worship foreign idols. Then God would send somebody, a prophet, usually to call them to repentance. They would repent in their distress because God usually brought an enemy along the way uh, to, to destroy them in a sense. And then they would repent, they would turn back to God And in their prosperity, they would forsake him. And the cycle continued on and on. And Azariah is saying to Asa, hey, let let me give you a lesson from the past. Let me tell you about what's happened in the past. And maybe it will guide your future. Maybe it will help you. And it all, it does us all good to learn the lessons of the past. He says there, For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. Now, most likely he is referring to the period of time that the judges were ruling in Israel. If you went back and read the book of Judges, matter of fact, I read you a scripture from Judges uh, a couple of weeks ago from the very last chapter and the very last verse. It says that since there was no king, there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right or fitting in their own eyes. They did what they wanted to do. And that's probably the time period he is referring to here. And he says there that for a long time, Israel was without the true God. Now the language indicates that he's probably referring to the blessings, them living under the blessings of God or the presence of God because they weren't worshiping God. They weren't seeking after the Lord. They were seeking their own will. They were seeking their own way. They were doing what was right in their eyes. He said they were, they were not living under the blessing. They were living under the judgment of God. 
because they were not being obedient to what God had said. And so, so when he says there, they were without the true God, the, the, the language indicates it's more of the blessings. There was no fresh word coming to them because they weren't listening. They didn't want to hear from God. It says that they were without a priest to teach. And you can read throughout the Old Testament, there were times that the priest who did try to teach them, uh, they were being led by the wrong spirit. It wasn't the spirit of God speaking through them. And then the ones who did try to, to speak what God's word had said, uh, the people didn't want to hear it. They hardened their hearts. They became stiff-necked. We don't want to hear the word. And see, the idea here is not so much that they didn't have God or they didn't have his word, but that they did not want it. They rejected it. That's what the language indicates here in the Hebrew language. Is they, they, it wasn't they didn't have it, it's that they didn't want it. They rejected it. And it also says there that they were without the law. Last night, we had a, a marriage renewing service. Uh, um, Johnny and Melissa Rivera had a, a renewing their vows ceremony, real sweet ceremony. And Brother Morgan preached that ceremony. And one thing he said struck me last night was that the home, the family, was not designed to be a patriarchy in that the husband was just the dictator. It wasn't designed to be a matriarchy where the wife was the CEO and she ran all everything. He said it was really designed to be a theocracy where God, they all submitted to the, to the Holy Spirit and to his word and God ran the home. But the third point that he made was, he said, you know, well, well, as the daddy was not supposed to be a dictator and the mama wasn't supposed to be a CEO, the children weren't supposed to run the house either. He said that was called anarchy. <laughs> I thought it was a good point. It's kind of the same example of the patients are running the asylum. You ever heard that before? Uh, or the prisoners are running the prison. I don't know if you've ever seen shows or documentaries on different prisons where the prisoners took over. It's anarchy. And that's what he's describing here is without the law, they were living in lawlessness. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You know, Isaiah 53 in verse six says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. It's what we've all done. And our shepherd, the Bible says that for his saints, for his children, for his sheep, he'll leave the 99 and go calling after the one that's left. What a great shepherd we have. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want when I walk with him and he walks with me. As John chapter 15 describes, when I abide in him and he abides in me, what is there to want? He provides. He said, for a long time, Israel was without the true God. They were without a priest to teach. Without the law, they were living in lawlessness. But the good news to him was, or from him was, but in their distress, when they finally turned to God and sought him, he was found by them. That was the good news. They were living in lawlessness. But when they cried out to him, he heard their cry and he rescued them. He said in verse five, in those days, it was not safe to travel about. For all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. He said, in those days, it was not safe. When you have a nation that all they're doing, everyone is, is doing what they want to do, when they are, are seeking their own way and living in that kind of anarchy and lawlessness, the only thing they could do was turn in on themselves, which is what the nation of, of Israel began to do. He says that nation crushed nations. And cities crushed cities. It didn't say they just defeated them. It said they crushed them. So it was not safe for anyone to travel. Well, let's just be real for a moment. Not that we've been unreal this time, but let's just be honest with each other for a moment. You ever had times where you felt it unsafe to come to the house of God? You ever had times where you were uneasy about going into a room of people 
not sure what you were going to face. Come on now. It was unsafe. Because you see, when a people turn on themselves, it's not safe for anyone. It's not peaceful for anyone. He said, back then, they couldn't even travel down the road because a brother would attack a brother. A nation would attack a nation. A city attacked a, a, a city. They were brothers and sisters in the nation. They attacked each other. And that's what happens when we start focusing on us. Because if, if I've got my mind set on me and I'm going to have what I want, I'm going to have it no matter the cost. We turn inward. And that's what was happening with them. He said, in those days, it wasn't safe to travel about. For all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. There was no peace. But I want you to see that it, it was God who was troubling them. God who was drawing them back to himself. It was God who was, who was uh, the King James uses the word vexing or vexations. That it was God who was doing this. He was stirring them up. He was stirring up trouble to draw them back. And that's what he said there. He said, we, we need to remember our past. But I love what verse seven says. You see, there, not only is there a, review of the present. There's a remembrance of the past, but there's a reassurance for the future. Look at what he says there. But as for you, be strong and do not give up for your work will be rewarded. I love that phrase, but as for you. Now King James says, be ye therefore. And then other translations says, but you. But I love the way the NIV captures this because it says, but as for you. He's comparing, this is what we used to be in the past. These are the, the, the things that we went through before. But as for you, as for you, it's not you anymore. This is not you, he's what he was saying to Asa. It may have been how the Israel was. It may have been some of the, the things that they've gone through in the past, but that's not who they were then. He said, that's not who you are now. But as for you, be strong. But as for you, don't give up. And as for you, your work will be rewarded. And what I would say to you this morning, First Baptist Church, is we may have had a season where we were in turmoil and it may not have been safe to enter into the house of God, but it's not who you are anymore. It's not who we are. But as for you, be strong. But as for you, don't give up. But as for you, your work will be rewarded. Amen. I'm going to tell you something, church. I've made up my mind. I refuse to be characterized and judged by who I used to be. Hallelujah. Oh, if we all sit down and write down who we used to be. <laughs> Aren't you glad that what goes on in our brain is not broadcasted on the screens? <laughs> Amen. I will not be characterized by who I once was because it's not who I am today. Oh, I've messed up in the past done stupid things in the past. I've gone my own way when God was over there. I went this way, but it's not who I am today. And I will not be characterized by who I used to be, but what I will do is I'll learn from what my mistakes were. I'll look back at those times I ran away from God and I will say, Lord, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do that again. I wanna walk side by side, moment by moment, seeking after you. We cannot be characterized. We remember the past, but there's a reassurance of the future. We can learn from our mistakes. We can repent from those things that we used to be, but that's not who we are now. But as for you, be strong. Do not give up. Your work will be rewarded. Amen. Let's stand to your feet, every head bowed and every eye closed. It said, but in their distress, they turned to the Lord. In their distress, they turned to the Lord. If you're distressed in here this morning, 
you can turn to God. You can seek him. He will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. I don't know what God's speaking to your heart this morning. But I'm asking you to be obedient. You may be here today and you say, I don't know what you're talking about this morning. I don't understand the spiritual things you're referring to. You may be saying in your heart, you know what? I don't know this God whom you refer. And then I want to take a moment to tell you about Jesus Christ who loved you enough to come to this earth as a sinless, all God, all man, died on the cross as we've sung about today, shed his blood as payment for your sin. He was buried but rose again on the third day. And he today is holding out his open arms saying, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me. You can lay your guilt, your sin at his feet today and he will save you. He will change you. You may be here and you're like some of these that we've discussed today. You're in distress. Turn to the Lord. Seek after him. And he'll be found. Maybe you just want to come to this altar this morning and say, I'm going to pray for our church. God got every step. There are men here this morning that can help you. I'll be up front as well. If God is speaking to your heart, you come. Father, we thank you for your word today. I thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. And Father, you know every heart, every person that is struggling in their heart right now with what you've spoken to them. I pray that you simply be obedient, come. Lord, for that person that's lost and going to hell, I pray you speak to them, convict them, and draw them. May they come, surrender their life to Christ. Lord, you have your will and your way in this invitation. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, he begins to sing, you do as God has spoken to your heart.